telehealth is screaming out with popularity. Venture funding continues to pour in and laws are increasingly improving. Today on the show, we have one of the top experts in the telemedicine legal and business community, Nathaniel Lackman, chair of the telemedicine industry team at the prestigious law firm of Foley and Lardner. I've got plenty of questions. He's got the answers. And together, that makes for another engaging show right here on Red Hot Healthcare. Let's go. This is Red Hot Healthcare. Interviews with today's leaders and all the news that matters. Here's your host, Steve Ambrose. Hello and great to have you aboard. I'm your host, Dr. Steve Ambrose. For past and upcoming episodes, find us on iTunes and most podcast directories or on our eye-catching website, redhothealthcare.com. Today's episode of Red Hot Healthcare is sponsored by Walk the Ridge. Incivility between those of different opinions and views is skyrocketing. It's causing harm to relationships as well as results in corporate culture. Walk the Ridge is a movement that's free to join, and it stresses that people practice tips and strategies in better listening and more civility. Join for free and download our free guides for individuals and businesses at walktheridge.org. That's walktheridge.org. Walk the Ridge, promoting greater civility in our society. Nathaniel Lackman is a partner and healthcare lawyer with Foley and Lardner. He's the chair of the firm's telemedicine industry team and co-chair of the firm's digital health work group. He advises healthcare providers and technology companies into the safer waters of business arrangements, compliance, corporate matters, with particular attention paid to telehealth, digital health, and healthcare innovation. Plus, he's a creative and critical thinker who serves on many different telehealth state and national associations. Nate, I want to welcome you to Red Hot Healthcare. It's a privilege and pleasure to have you aboard. Well, thank you, Steve, for having me. It's my pleasure. Could you bring us up to speed on where telehealth is today on a, on a very high level? The last 12 months, we've seen a lot of changes in state laws. There's federal proposals. Uh, maybe you can just comment a bit on that. We've seen over the last five years some sweeping state and federal legislative changes that really have brought the telemedicine industry from infancy to adolescence. And I think that 2018 will be a landmark inflection point. Mm. There are so many opportunities for hospitals or health systems or entrepreneurs to both establish new programs and grow vibrant telemedicine offerings. Even just among emerging companies and startups, venture capital funding in 2017 touched $7 billion. That's more money than ever before. But interestingly, it was deployed to fewer companies than prior years. What does this portend? It means that over the next two to three years, we'll likely see more mergers and acquisitions and consolidation of telemedicine and digital health companies. And then after that, we'll see private equity get more interested as these entities are no longer a niche or specialty play and they have broader appeal. Mm, Right. We also published, my law firm published the the 2017 report on uh, the state of telemedicine and digital health. And we had over 100 respondents from C-suite level hospitals, specialty clinics, and provider groups. So these are your traditional established providers, not necessarily all the pro-telemedicine startup companies. That report was a follow-up to a similar survey we conducted in 2014. 80% of the respondents said, look, we do not expect our patients to be using telemedicine services uh, by 2017. But when we did the survey... Uh, last fall, over 75% of the respondents are now actually currently offering or planning to offer telemedicine services. Wow. Plus, over half of them said, hey, we have telemedicine programs already, but we're going to significantly grow and increase them. Let's talk a little bit about Foley and Lardner, the uh, legal organization you work for. This firm is certainly a, a top 10 firm nationwide in all areas, but really making a big push in telehealth and not just for providers. Besides that, you also work with other branches of healthcare. Is that right? Oh, certainly. While my heart really is with providers of services, uh, innovation comes from everywhere. So we work with uh, manufacturers, software developers, uh, innovators, and entrepreneurs across the healthcare spectrum. 
it's a real pleasure sometimes to work with folks who don't have a traditional healthcare background and can look at the same problem, but come up with a vastly different solution. You're certainly coming into these organizations uh, from a legal standpoint. So the first thing I'm thinking in my mind, Nate, is, okay, they want to bring you on for regulatory. They want to make sure they're not going to get sued and everything's compliant. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine not just from a legal sense, but you really almost have to be somebody that understands business, business models, and then maybe even a bit on the innovative side. So when you take on a client, do you find that clients might have some deficiencies or maybe have like a need for different tactics and strategies regarding telehealth that maybe they didn't even ever think of? When we work with hospitals and established providers, one of the things that we focus on and that they really need outside of the traditional legal advice is understanding how to use this technology in a strategic manner. It's not sufficient for them to tell patients, hey, you can get a checkup via video now. They need to know that uh, telehealth is a tool. It's not a specialty service line. It does not need to cannibalize their existing in-person services, but it could instead complement or augment them. And so we work with them to strategically deliver their medical services in a new, better, faster, stronger way. For the entrepreneurs and innovators who we work with, those folks have great ideas, but no healthcare background. And believe me, there's a lot of them. They need more help understanding how their idea fits into the existing healthcare industry and how services are provided. So that involves not just legal advice, but it involves knowing how patient and provider referral patterns work. What are the type of oversight requirements and who are the entities or agencies uh, uh, with oversight authority? They need to know corporate practice and medicine rules, uh, and they need to balance all the traditional healthcare fraud and abuse and compliance rules against creating a really high user experience. Mm. Put another way, a lawyer who takes an entrepreneur's innovative idea and just crushes it into a traditional healthcare box, not only does his client a disservice, but that can undermine the very thing that makes that entrepreneur's idea special or unique. And so we see a lot of clients who come to us after they were disappointed with their prior experiences working with other lawyers, and they're really surprised and flabbergasted with our fresh approach to working with them. You know, the venture capital community certainly is heavy into healthcare and healthcare IT, and they're investing like never before. But one of the things that they maybe didn't think about in the beginning when they made so many investments that some of them are realizing now is not just how commoditized the space is, especially when, let's say, selling to a hospital or a, a health system, but how long the sales process is. A lot of times, uh, VCs, you know, tended to look at healthcare and especially selling into healthcare like selling into any other industry. And until they really got specialized in it, I think they put a lot of investing dollars out there. And suddenly, you know, it was an eye opener when they're like, wait a minute, our, our money's being used up so quickly here. What's going on? It's like, well, <laughs> it takes 12 to 24 months to get a product actually in pilot. And then most of the time, that's not even going to go enterprise. Your perspective really is is taken well, Nate, because I think a lot of attorneys might come in and sort of just try to treat telehealth or health IT the same way. And I think it, I think it really does do a disservice just to treat it as if it's just like any other technology. Yeah, and you know that reminds me of when I saw your presentation at, at the VC conference, uh, really focusing on marketing healthcare through technology. What, what we have now is a situation where there's a real democratization in healthcare. The keys are no longer held just by hospitals and traditional providers. If we wanted to, you and I could team up and create our own medical group and deliver telemedicine services across the country. And we'd primarily market or advertise it through the internet, right? And so branding matters and marketing approaches matter so patients can actually find you, get attracted to your services, and enjoy the benefit of it. I think that's a place where a lot of the traditional Providers are failing, but the entrepreneur, non, non-traditional healthcare companies are really succeeding. What do you see now as maybe the biggest legal hurdles remaining in telehealth in terms of it becoming, you know, ubiquitously used, fully adopted around the country? You know, where do you see some of the, the big legal hurdles still remaining? Four primarily. Hands down, number one, based on our survey and every what everyone talks about is reimbursement and revenue opportunities. Providers get paid for in-person services. It, it's established. But they don't all get paid for virtual care services. That's wrong. 
they should get paid for it. It's the same service. Uh, your medical degree costs the same, whether you're delivering your care in person or via telemedicine, and the patient's benefit is is identical. So I think uh, that inconsistency among states and among different health plans, and whether you're in network or not, has created not only confusion, but maybe a sense uh, uh, that, oh, uh, I have to be a cash pay model, and that's not true. The second would be hospital and health plan credentialing. By and large, that various health plans, they may have 50 different requirements uh, uh, of a, that a doctor must meet in order to be credentialed and provide services that health plans members. But do you really think the credentialing requirements from one Aetna subsidiary of California versus a different Aetna subsidiary of California or an Aetna subsidiary of Nevada are all that different? Right. They are not right? You're practicing medicine. You're a doctor. You have your credential. They basically all operate from the same playbook. Why then does an individual doctor need to be credentialed separately with all of these various plans, right? The same can be said with hospitals and the same can be said for the third point, which is licensing. You're providing these same services and now you're delivering them across geographic borders. And that is the only difference. And yet the amount of paperwork that's required is astronomical. There's a physician, he's a friend of mine named uh, Eric Anderson. He's a neurologist. He is licensed in about 30 states and credentialed at about 80 different hospitals. And he said he has a team wow. <laughs> He has a team of four people who help him with his paperwork. And not a day goes by where he doesn't have to sign some sort of CME or type of credentialing renewal form, either online or wedding card copy in the mail. Crazy. That is, I mean, why, right? What good does that really do? So that is a uh, an issue that is desperately in need of a solution. And I think the fourth-ish area would be super on-site supervision rules of non-physician practitioners and, and incident to billing. We get it. Doctors are plenary practitioners, uh, meaning they're sort of at the highest level of scope of practice. But we have a ton of healthcare services delivered by professionals who are not physicians. Yet some states have different supervision rules requiring the doctor to be in the same building as the non-physician and vis-a-vis the patient. It's all designed for oversight and leverage. By and large, it makes no sense when services are delivered in the telemedicine context because the patient might be at home. So why does it matter where the non-physician is and where the physician is if neither of them are in the same building as the patient? Right. So I think that's an example of traditional localized healthcare rules on a state level, not yet up to speed with delivering medical care through new technologies. Could there ever be a set of telehealth rules or a telehealth law federally that could trump all states? Or is it really a state by state thing and it has to stay that way in terms of sort of making these decisions on on how telehealth rolls out, how it's used and governed? Well, the closest example we have in the healthcare space is the VA. The legislation, and then VA put out a regulation before the legislation came out, which basically says as long as you're a doctor working for the VA, you can deliver services in any state to patients located even at their home, and you need just to have a license in one state. Right, that's the closest thing we have right now, and they did that under some constitutional law notions of it's a vested federal property right. I think because of a sovereign immunity clause and states' rights, we're not going to see a federal medical license. Uh, What states uh, could do if the federal government wanted to do it is they could probably tie some strings to a federal funding or benefit. The closest equivalent of that would be driver's licenses, right? So I have a Florida driver's license, but it's recognized and valid in all these other states. Why is that? Because there's federal funding tied to interstate highways, and that's kind of a condition of getting that money. Every state needs to recognize that reciprocity. Ah. You could do the same thing with medicine or other professions. I don't see it as likely to occur. We have situations like compacts where third-party organizations create a legislative solution and each state signs on to an identical law, buys into it. We have the Federation of State Medical Board's Interstate Physician Licensure Compact, which is less of a compact, unfortunately, in its final version, more of just a single-source clearinghouse to apply for a bunch of different state uh, licenses simultaneously. What's a much better approach, in my opinion, for providers is like the nurse licensure compact, where it says if you are a nurse and you're licensed in the state of Texas, and Texas is a state participating in the compact, your license works automatically in all of the other 30-some states that participate in the compact. That is truly a streamlined 
concept. Nate, telehealth is rolling out. And one of the biggest concerns that I could see from the payer side might be not necessarily overutilization, but how about, let's say, uh, you know, fake visits, what we would call years ago, we, we learned in the prof- in our profession was ghost visits or maybe upcoding. So it wasn't really a, t- you know, it really wasn't a 40 minute, but it was billed as a 40 minute. It was only really 10 minutes. Um, where do you see the potential red flags for telehealth in terms of fraud and abuse and, you know, moving forward? And then maybe what sort of monitoring tools um, do you see out there now or do you think you're going to be needed to detect this? I don't perceive that telehealth providers have a greater uh, likelihood or capacity or potential for upcoding or improper undocumented services than a traditional provider. They may not have as robust compliance programs or may not be as well steeped in billing and coding requirements if they come from self-pay businesses or private sector that isn't used to the healthcare billing and coding rules, right? So that's just sheer lack of lack of knowledge or, or lack of hiring the right people. I think a, an area of risk uh, is kickbacks and fee splitting. Yeah, talk about that a little bit more, please. We talked about this off air. Uh, maybe you can just sort of explain this to our audience a bit more and some of the more pervasive things that you're you're seeing with it. Unlike ma- most industries, in healthcare, it's illegal to reward someone, to give somebody something of value to induce or incentivize or reward past or future referrals of business. So you can't have an arrangement where you'll say, hey, you know, I'll give you 20 bucks for every patient that you refer over to me. This is a simplified uh, example. Or if you have someone who's a really big, uh, who refers you a really big project or or business in healthcare, you can't reward them with um, buying them an iPhone, all right, as a thank you. Gotcha. It's designed to limit the ability to improperly influence decision making because they say patients should be referred to the provider who's most appropriate to their needs, not who may have the best type of a kickback or financial arrangement. Primarily exists for federal healthcare program dollars. However, what a lot of companies and entrepreneurs don't realize is that these laws also exist. They're known as all-payer contracts and even apply to cash payments in about 30, 35 states. Although it doesn't have the same level of enforcement, the legal analysis is virtually identical. So one of the things that we do, particularly when we're working with uh, innovators and entrepreneurs who have multi-party arrangements and are trying to vertically integrate the patient experience, right? They want to make a high UX so that the patient uh, is online, then they see a provider, then they're easily able to transmit any prescription or order for DME or laboratory to an affiliated, but maybe a third party entity who can then take up the patient and really fill those gaps that traditionally the patients fall out, right? The go-betweens. You see a doctor, but then you got to go somewhere else to get your labs and you got to go somewhere else to get your CPAP machine, somewhere else to get your prescriptions. That's a pain in the behind, right? All right. If those entities built out an arrangement where they're having percentage of revenue sharing or fee splitting or swapping or steering, that's a real problem from a healthcare fraud and abuse compliance perspective. So we do spend a lot of time with our clients doing those type of uh, arrangements to educate them on the rules because sometimes they're completely unaware of them, get them to understand why they're important, and then help them pivot their initial draft of their business model or, or their arrangement to an alternate that is acceptable uh, level of risk and that would not expose the company uh, to problems down the road. I want the telemedicine industry to stay on course with that. Uh, Other industries like the home health agencies and and DME industry have really been uh, looked with some side-eye skepticism uh, from the government and regulators because of rampant fraud and abuse and practices like that. We're seeing it more in the uh, substance abuse addiction recovery space, and I and I think it's unfortunate, but it's maybe just a, a natural development of the opioid crisis and more and more people with addiction needs that uh, there's basically headhunters and recruiters getting paid to refer patients um, and people at you know, NA meetings to different substance abuse providers. Mm-hmm. Another area that I think a lot of entrepreneurs in telemedicine, telehealth don't understand or don't fully appreciate is the prohibition on the corporate practice of medicine. I said earlier how you and I could create a telemedicine company, a medical group if you want, and that's true, but unless either of us are a licensed physician, we wouldn't really be able to own that entity to deliver services. So about half of the states have this prohibition, which prohibits a layperson from owning a medical company or employing doctors. 
and professionals to deliver services. So there are some complicated nuanced structures with management arrangements and whatnot that entities can use, entrepreneurs can use to comply with these rules. They've been used by private equity firms for years when they roll up and acquire physician practices or dermatology or chiropractor or or dentist groups. Uh, And they have a some really great application in telemedicine because not only do you have to comply with that laws of one state, but you need to comply with the laws of all the states in which you want to operate. And any multi-state telemedicine company is going to want to operate in uh, California, Texas, New York, you know, some of these major states, and they all have corporate practice and medicine prohibitions. Just in the last answer here, Nate, clearly there's a lot of people that might set themselves up for getting into hot water or even getting in hot water. And I don't necessarily know if the VC companies that are funding them, let's say, or angel investors would know any different for some of these nuanced areas. I mean, do you really recommend that, you know, they they come to you before they take their money from VCs or present to VCs or, you know, after they get the funding? I mean, what do you recommend in that area? That's a tough question because I want to see all of these companies succeed. We'll be engaged by clients that are uh, either self-funded or pre-funded. Right? They may have revenue or money from other sources uh, and not this particular business, and that's fine. Other times, uh, we'll have clients say, oh, I'm bootstrapping it or I'm shoestringing it, which I think if they're trying to create a, even just within a single state, a healthcare company, much less a health technology innovation company, and they don't have a budget for it, they need to rethink their, their business planning 101. If you're going to open a, a bakery on a corner of a local main street, you will have a budget. No one will give you a loan. And here we're talking about one of the most highly regulated industries in the country. I I recommend, I also think for some of the entrepreneurs who don't want to take on venture capital or angel funding, I say 100% of zero is zero, right? And it's okay to gamble with someone else's money who has confidence in you. Certainly don't sell all the control of your company out the gate. The other thing is, when do you hire a lawyer? Certainly there are legal fees and you need to have the funds for it. But I don't recommend entrepreneurs saying, you know what, let's just run with this. Let's build something out. And once it's a success, well, then we'll revisit it and make sure that it's compliant with all the rules and regulations. Because what they don't understand is you could build a highly successful, scalable business based on illegal kickbacks, right? And then everybody's like, wow, this company is going gangbusters. How do they do it? What's their secret? Right, And then you finally get a lawyer involved, either because they think it's time or maybe they're going to have some real money investing it. And then they'll hire a law firm like mine to do regulatory due diligence and totally tear it apart. And you'll say, you need to change these things. Otherwise, we're not going to invest. And they'll say, well, if we change these things, our company won't function. And we're like, yeah, because you built out a, a business model or an entire company predicated on an arrangement that doesn't comply with the law. Right, And so shame on you for not doing your your homework on the front end. So I really do strongly urge uh, clients to reach out at least for a a preliminary screening. So you know we get calls all the time and I think it's the right thing to do. We give a half hour that we don't charge for, right? And we talk about it and see if it's a good fit. And we also like leave it on the field, give them our best advice and answers. And if they like it and and they want to work with us, that's great. If they don't, you know, at least they've got some more information that they can use when working on their own model. Yeah, quite frequently, you know, we'll have a call, we'll talk with a client and may not hear from them for three or six months. And then they came back and said, we thought about it. We raised a little bit of operating capital and we want to do things the right way. And that's what I really like to hear from clients is we have this great idea. It could be a game changer. Don't know what the healthcare rules are, but we want to do things the right way. Nate, can you touch on what we chatted about off air, and that is some of the statistics that come out from the telehealth companies? As HIMSS is coming closer, I'm getting a lot of requests from companies coming in, and and some of the numbers are pretty impressive, and they look pretty big. Maybe we can just very quickly touch base on what you told me that, you know, tends to happen sometimes in terms of uh, telehealth visits and those numbers. Yeah, I, you know, some companies uh, they tout the the sheer volume of how many telemedicine consults or encounters they have, and sometimes I feel like it's almost Im- these numbers are impossibly large, particularly if, if I've never heard of the company. Uh, certainly, I don't want to call into question everybody's numbers and data, and people define visits differently. You know, it's virtual care; they could define it as logging into a patient portal 
or they could define it as emails, right? And whereas other people may define it only as discrete medical events or perhaps audio video consults. But what I would sort of caution about are suspect or sham telehealth arrangements where it really does present a high risk of kickbacks and fee splitting, and it may be funded by the ultimate supplier, like the pharmacy or the DME company, because that is something to be very cognizant of. Similarly, uh, international services or offshoring. It's fine to have a Florida licensed doctor live in uh, New York and deliver telemedicine services to patients in Florida. You could bill you could bill Medicare for that. But if that same doctor is licensed in Florida, lives in India, for example, and is doing the service, there's a per se rule Medicare will not pay for it, nor will Medicaid programs or in federal regulations. And it just has become popular to have offshore contracts or have U.S. licensed doctors living abroad, you can typically pay them less than you would have pay a doctor living in the U.S. And ergo, it's a cheaper price point for customers. But having them located overseas presents a, a compliance risk. You know, we talked a little bit about when we met last September, I gave a talk on telehealth and, and we just broached on it before. But, you know, I, I sort of took the perspective that as we get into a more consumeristic shift here, you know, partially because first dollars are certainly going to continue for a long time, it looks like, to come out of patients and employees' pockets, that health systems really have an opportunity, I feel, innate to use telehealth in a way to actually start growing their remote base. Not just the base that they actually have physical presence in with facilities, but then also maybe, you know, one day having a, a health system like New York Presbyterian maybe serving certain parts of Alabama or Montana or Arizona patients and being able to bill for those and and maybe at some point either manage those populations or maybe even partner uh, physical uh, locations that they don't have, but maybe they have joint ownership with. You know, I'd like you to speak on that a little bit, maybe just nationally and internationally. What are your thoughts on telehealth and maybe how it can be used for growth? Steve, you and I are, are are very similarly aligned in this mindset, and I think you can boil that down into a sentence from John Noseworthy, the CEO of Mayo Clinic, who, speaking about destination medicine, said, 10 years from now, there will emerge just a few medical centers with the reputation for healthcare excellence and patient-focused outcomes that will attract patients from all over the world. He's, he just announced his retirement and has left quite some big shoes to fill. And I think we're going to see more of that. We're going to see the, uh, the flagship names, the Mayo Clinics, the Johns Hopkins, the MD Andersons, the Sloan Ketterings, the Mass General Hospitals, uh, using their name recognition to attract patients from all over the country. They'll do so through online second opinion programs with easy way for patients located anywhere to access the deep medical expertise of their professionals. And then if they like what they see in their diagnosis or treatment recommendation, they will then fly to that location for their surgery and for their treatment. What that will do, it'll be great for those flagships, right? And they'll be able to do more of what they want to do and become even more specialized or subspecialized. The risk for hospitals and provider groups that don't use similar tactics or strategies is that they'll experience a brain drain. And the new crop of doctors will want to do residencies at these flagship institutions because that's where the most exciting cutting edge work is being done. There's that phrase, nothing gathers a crowd like a crowd and the bigger get bigger. And I think that's what could very likely happen using the internet, basically, right? To promote and, and advertise and deliver these type of services across the country. And then, you know, it's no secret Mayo wants to do it globally as well. There's another cool opportunity with that uh, that goes hand in hand. And that's really the sharing of, of patient medical data either for aggregation and mining purposes like you right. see in genetic counseling or just to tap into databases and make them better. And every provider, and I bet we'll see it at HIMSS in a, in a week and a half, uh, every provider is interested. They're very bullish on this and the power of putting more data into the machine learning and the AI and, and whatnot. What people aren't really paying enough attention to, in my opinion, is getting the proper patient authorization to use their data. You know, there are very specific rules about that. Everyone is focused on breaches. Oh, cybersecurity is breach. <laughs> you cannot, can, nothing, nothing is hack proof, in my opinion. You cannot absolutely prevent a breach, right? Mistakes happen. And I think the, the public is forgiving on that, right? Yes, it, it takes a big splash, but then it goes away. And if you look at the settlements, actually, from the Federal Office of uh, OCR, who does all the enforcement on, on HIPAA breaches, 
frankly, there's not a ton of them. They are fewer last year than the prior year. And the president's proposed budget slashed OCR's budget by 20%. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of you know prioritization and these breaches? I think it's a very different scenario, though, if we see a provider who turns out to have sold a bunch of patient data, got paid right. for it, didn't get the patient's authorization, and then patients find out. Because that's a deliberate choice. And even if there's like great clinical benefits and whatnot, if you're required to get the patient's permission and you don't do it and you chose to sell it um, to somebody else, I think you're going to see a much less forgiving uh, public for those type of activities. Thus far, I am unaware of any federal OCR settlement predicated on that, you know, basically improper information sharing or disclosure. Uh, They're all focused on, oh, someone stole a laptop or someone forgot their security key, you know. Those are human errors and mistakes can happen. But I think there's going to be real potential for this type of a thing. And I think health technology companies need to be a bit more cognizant about the patient authorization and opt-in. It's not just opt-out right? Uh, type of rules here. Let's move into the BBA, the Bipartisan Budget Act. Basically, for those who don't know, in February 2018, Congress passed and the president signed into law the Bipartisan Budget Act. Uh, One of the things that a lot of people didn't know, unless they dug a bit deeper into the health side, was that one of the policy changes offered the potential to improve access and quality of care for Medicare beneficiaries, uh, especially those who have chronic conditions. It also expanded telehealth benefits in a rather positive way. So, Nate, if you could, I'd like you to go over some of the uh, telehealth benefits that have been added into this and that are now law and maybe some of the impact that you see having them on the future of our uh, healthcare system. Certainly. And, and I wrote a blog on this when, when the bill came out or was passed into law, if you uh, Red Hot listeners are interested. It's called Top 5 Ways Telehealth Will Change Under the New Federal Funding Bill. What's your address your blog? Healthcarelawtoday.com. Healthcarelawtoday.com. Okay, go ahead. So th- it, there's five ways. First, it's going to expand Medicare coverage for telestroke services to mobile stroke units, which could possibly include you know, ambulances or stroke mobiles like the Cleveland Clinic has, or maybe even the patient's home or other locations. The, the law gives CMS the authority to determine what constitutes a site. But that means at the gate, all the hospitals, no matter where they're located, are qualified to get payment. They no longer have to be in a rural location. That's mm. huge because people get strokes in cities too, right? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the second is dialysis. Di- uh, dialysis and ESRD were big benefit fisheries under this. Uh, currently, independent dialysis facilities were not eligible sites for Medicare telehealth payment. Now they are. And the, the patient's home as well. The patient can get telehealth services at home in connection with their dialysis oversight and therapy. Medicare will pay for That's that. That's huge. That's huge. Huge for dialysis patients. There's another one with dialysis too. In connection with that, there's these laws that are related to the anti-kickback statute, but they're known as civil monetary penalties laws. And instead of giving a kickback to somebody who refers a patient, the concept is if you give a kickback or an inducement to a patient to get them to hire you for your services, that's a problem, right? (laughs) So in the past, it's been, I know, right, these rules. So (laughs) in in the past, it's been a problem for some telehealth providers to say, look, we want to deliver services to patients at home, but there's a technology, whether it's like a scale or some type of monitor, who knows, no one will pay for it. And we don't want to have to charge the patient out of pocket for that because that's not right and the patients won't use it. However, it could be considered a, an inducement. That's changed, and they've, they they said no longer you can give this type of equipment. It needs to meet three little elements, but if, if you meet that, you can give all this software and telehealth software and equipment to di- ESRD patients for free for them to receive telehealth-based dialysis services at their home. That's mm-hmm. another patient-focused uh, change. The fourth change is Medicare Advantage plans. Right now, a lot of MA plans don't uh, fully cover telehealth services because when they do their periodic bid RFP submissions, it doesn't count as a basic benefit medical spend. And when they do those bids, they want to show that, look, we, we spent like 85 cents of every dollar or 90 cents of every dollar on direct medical care. Because uh, the rest, basically, whether it's an additional benefit or profit or administrative overhead, it just goes in the other bucket. 
So you're talking you're talking about the medical loss ratio, right? Yeah, M- MLRs, exactly. So by this new this funding bill changed it though because it will allow MA plans to include a broad spectrum of telehealth services as a basic benefit, core medical spend, which will make it very attractive for MA plans to cover it because then they get to include all of that as a medical spend in MLR when they do their bids. Wow, that is big. And then the last one is to me, not as exciting, but it's all right. It gives certain accountable care organizations the ability to expand the use of telehealth services through more waivers. They already do enjoy a number of waivers, and it just continues to expand it. Those are the five telehealth changes in the federal funding bill. I want to ask you a personal opinion here. I, you work with a lot of different clients. I don't necessarily want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to try to put you on the spot anyway. What are the most, or maybe who might be the most innovative uh, providers and organizations using telehealth today. Are there any that stand out to you as sort of like, wow, you know, just watch out for this in the next couple of years or wow, you know, this is going to be a game changer? You know, it's hard because it's like asking me to pick who my favorite child is. I could maybe pick a couple that I uh, work with that uh, respect their level of ambition, willing to tackle some big problems, right? Because innovation can be small. Innovation you know, an example of innovation that I think is incredible actually has to do with anesthesiology. In the past, the equipment that changes the gas and the drug dosage in hospitals for anesthesia looked different. Every company made different equipment, and it's confusing for the anesthesiologists. They all got together, and the company said, let's make our interface, our dials look exactly the same. And it made it so much easier for anesthesiologists and patient deaths and risk and harm from anesthesia dropped precipitously, right? That's an wow. example of innovation, uh, ambitious, but huge impact. The companies that we're working with that I think are doing something really ambitious would include, you know, Mercy Virtual, for example, because they have some uh, nation spanning telehealth services and looking to care not for the low acuity urgent care triage type patients like the teledoc stuff, but the sickest of the sick the most chronically, most expensive 5% patients. And they're coming up with solutions for that, right? Using telehealth for sepsis, all sorts of stuff. Uh, Mayo Clinic, really feel grateful for the opportunity to work with them, particularly on their international outreach and services. I like how MD Live, for example, has been really doubled down and trying to become the world's largest, uh, the country's largest provider group with a particular focus on Medicaid, Medicaid managed care population, and then expanding into behavioral and, and mental health services. On the startup side, there's a company we work with uh, called Keeps Medical Group, and they have this really great uh, direct-to-consumer, store-and-forward-based men's hair loss service. And you think, oh, men's hair loss. Well, yes, it's a, it's a direct-to-consumer play, but it's vertically integrated and keeping the price at so competitive and affordable while maintaining high-quality physician-led services. I'm very impressed with uh, some of the stuff that they're doing. So those are just some different examples of taking on ambitious projects. Okay. And uh, you just give me the number for that last one off air if you could, Nate. Thank you. Um, <laughs> let's, move, let's move into uh, Teladoc. You mentioned them. And uh, when you talk about, or when we talk about Teladoc and Doctor on Demand, uh, essentially these are telehealth services that have no physical presence. As the health systems and the hospitals continue to get more mature, they're going to offer more telehealth integration into their care. Do you see companies, uh, Nate, like Teladoc eventually dropping away? You know, I, I don't think so. I, I would actually applaud them for being first to market with a vision and an easy to digest turnkey solution. Right. And among them, I, I could, you could kind of consider them the big four, MD Live, Teladoc, American Well, and Doctors on Demand. Each one offers a slightly different take or a flavor, right? American Well is very software focused. Teladoc has some world-class government affairs and lobbying and have really pushed the agenda on a state-by-state basis on practicing modalities. MD Live has really doubled down on the services. They focus on uh, putting the hospital partner first in their branding and partnership contracts, for example. American Well has that Ask an Expert partnership with Samsung. But all these turnkey solutions are going to need to continue to innovate and show value because the traditional providers are now offering their own telemedicine-based services. So again, we're seeing that. Teladoc acquired Best Doctors, which is sort of an online second opinion kind of service. MD Live has expanded into behavioral health. I I think they they really have a a value and a good play, particularly as it relates to payers, right, for consistency of services and cost containment. And I think we're going to continue to see innovation from these companies. 
Nate, let me pick your brain on something else while I'm picking away here. Where do you see pharmacies and pharmacists getting on board with telehealth and, and maybe you know integrating some new models there, maybe for drug uh, medication adherence, drug support? It's starting to enroll, to, to roll out, and I see it in three areas primarily. First is telepharmacist services, like those offered by Avera eCare. And so that would include, uh, they would contract with critical access hospitals, for example, and offer 24-7 medication review and remote order entry by pharmacists located at the Avera eCare facilities, right? That's a high value play for critical access hospital. You need to have the, the patient's medication orders reviewed and uh, verified by a pharmacist before they're administered. The second is remote pharmacies themselves. A remote pharmacy is something that might be staffed by a pharmacist or a pharmacy tech. They're like automated dispensing kiosks that there could be located within an institutional facility or a clinic or even you know a remote area. And so they have remote dispensing sites and they're kind of linked to coordinating pharmacies via telehealth type system. That's pretty cool too. Uh, it's basically the step in between where we have right now and just straight up drugs out of vending machines. Yeah. The final is MTM or medication therapy management. And this is an area where a lot of pharmacists feel very passionate about because they are trained clinical professionals. Uh, and what MTM is, it has medication therapy reviews, pharmacotherapy consults, anticoagulation management, health and wellness programs. And pharmacists would provide it as a service to help patients get the best benefits from their meds by actively managing their drug therapy or identifying, preventing, and resolving medication-related problems. I believe there are some codes for it, but by and large, uh, health plans and payers do not reimburse for it. So it's an area that pharmacist groups have been and associations have been pushing and advocating for a third-party reimbursement stream because it's basically you have a whole legion of trained clinical professionals that patients aren't really sufficiently tapping into because there's nobody yet paying for that service. And I think that could be helpful to not just unload the burden on the traditional primary care practitioners, but also have a very express way for patients to get a, a double check. Basically, you might forget what your doctor said in the waiting room, right? But then when you go to get your drugs from the pharmacy, if the pharmacist takes some time to do proper MTM, that can have a real benefit. So those would be the three areas I see with telemedicine and pharmacy. If you had a crystal ball, and you could look five, maybe seven years into the future. How do you see telehealth impacting the focus of the healthcare consumer? How do you see it maybe even impacting future types of business models? When you ask that question, I think back when I was in college, and I remember seeing the first advertisements during the Super Bowl for websites, right? And it was just silly dot com money, uh, people spending on these ads. And I thought to myself, who'd ever go online? When you have the yellow pages by your telephone. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the sky is the limit, right? There are people who say pretty soon telemedicine will just be medicine, like online banking is considered banking. I, I, I believe that could happen uh, absolutely. I am much more excited really about how to use the, the technology to find new ways for care. The vertical integration and the customer uh, experience I think is very important to me, and I think that has some of the most potential to increase. Already, our survey report noted it. Providers that offer telemedicine services, their patient satisfaction levels are off the charts. The same cannot be said for the traditional in-person experience. People don't like going to the doctor. They get white coat syndrome. They don't like waiting for anything. They particularly don't like waiting in uh, physician offices. I think because of that, we'll see more direct-to-consumer telehealth and retail medicine for some of the same reasons you mentioned with HDHP plans and changes to that. I think we'll see more asynchronous services in store and forward. Definitely see more remote patient monitoring, chronic care management, and non-face-to-face -face services. And I, I think already we're seeing a wave of telehealth for mental health, dermatology, and eye care and vision. Vision in particular, I mean, the eye care industry has done a really poor job of like having a good customer user experience and, and patient focused stuff. It's all, all the attention is on like, what do your frames look like for the glasses? Not on the, yeah. uh, the ease of, of the experience with the actual eye exams, much less the, how comprehensive they are. That's definitely going to change. There's a number of very exciting ocular health companies on the telehealth space doing some really neat stuff. Nathaniel Lackman, partner and healthcare lawyer with Foley and Lardner, and the chair of the firm's telemedicine industry team. 
and co-chair of their digital health work group. Nate, I want to thank you so much for making the time. I know your day is always busy, so we appreciate you coming on. And uh, I'm glad we could make this happen. And also, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you down at Hims in a few weeks. Thank you, Steve. This has been a real highlight. You've been listening to Red Hot Healthcare with Steve Ambrose. Subscribe to us on most major podcast directories. For media or business inquiries, reach out to media at redhothealthcare.com. Thanks for listening. This is Denny Colonna. We're out of here.